What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, I want to talk about something, and it's a question I get asked all year long. And Do I have to memorize this formula? Is this something I should memorize? And now that we're done with the year and we're done with the curriculum, I want to give you 10 different things that you should definitely memorize going into the AP exam. And by memorize, I don't just mean, you know, what are the variables? And you, you need to know how to use them and where they're appropriate because the reference table is only going to get you so far, especially on an AP exam where they tend to ask a lot of things that are qualitative and not so much formulas and plugging and chugging. So these are just some things that you should definitely have in your arsenal when going into the exam. And I'll do my best to pretty much do this in order of the course and the year that went on. The first thing that we saw early in the year is that if you have a speed or velocity, the average speed or velocity is going to be equal to the distance or displacement of an object over the amount of time that goes by. This is the very simplest definition. A change of position is a velocity. But this average velocity, we have to remember that V1 plus V2 over 2. That's really what average velocity means. So this formula can only be used, A, if the acceleration is constant and there's no change in V, or if you solve for what the average V is. All right, so this, is the, this was the first formula we really looked at in physics, and it was also the first time we looked at the difference between sk uh, speed, velocity, distance, and displacement, and those different types of vector types. Now, this is when it's easy to use this one when acceleration is constant. And like I said, when acceleration is not constant, that's where this comes in. And you can remember this as a two-step process, or you can make your life just a little bit easier and remember this formula. The displacement is equal to one-half V final plus V initial delta T. And guys, that's exactly, I just took this, substituted it in, and solve for displacement. So this is a great little kinematics formula to have in your tool belt. The next thing I think is really important to understand is when we got ourselves into inclined planes, and we understand that there is a force component weight here, but we learned that we have to separate these two weight components into FG parallel and FG that pushes into the surface. Now, the easiest way to remember this, because this FGY is going to oppose that and be really the F of the normal, so that we remember that FG parallel is really MG, that's how you find weight, right? And then sine of theta, where this is theta. And we remember this by saying sine makes it slide, and then the one that pushes into the surface and keeps it close to the surface, we remember that as MG cos keeps it close theta. So these two formulas here, yes, you can derive them, but like I said, let's save some time if we can do some memorization. And just remember, sine makes it slide, cos makes it close on an inclined plane, and how sine is usually the net force that's acting when there's no friction present, sliding down the incline, and the force of the normal is opposite to the close component of weight. So we could say that it's mg cosine theta. The next important thing to understand is the conservations. And the major ones we looked at are mechanical energy initial equals mechanical energy final. So, so important. Because remember, we had different energies. We had gravitational potential energy. We had spring potential energy. We had kinetic energy linear. We had kinetic energy rotational. So there's all these different energies. And we have to remember that when we have no outside forces acting, there's no outside energies entering the system that mechanical energy is conserved. And by mechanical energy, I just mean the sum of all of the energies. Now, we can throw in the work non-conservative as well, but we have to understand that this relationship, that the total energy before has to equal the total energy after. And I can be sure to tell you that on this 2020 exam that's been a little bit changed because of what's going on, they're only asking you two questions. So they have to encompass the entire course in two questions. So if you look at all of these different things that have to do with energy, not to mention that work is just a standard change in energy, I can assure you that you are going to see some sort of conservation relationship when it comes to energy on this year's exam. Please understand that mechanical energy initial equals total energy after. That's going to be very, very important, especially here in 2020. The other conservation that's very, very important to us is the linear momentum, P before equals P after. And this, this we saw in collisions, but we also had angular momentum before and angular momentum after. 
All right. So if there's no outside forces acting, momentum is conserved. And if there's no outside torques acting, then angular momentum is conserved. All of these relationships of conservation, especially this year in 2020, when these over arc so many different topics, I can guarantee you that in these two questions on the AP exam this year, conservation is going to be a really, really big deal. The fifth one that you're definitely going to want to memorize is this relationship, once again, that could be derived, but let's understand where this is coming from. And that is F, V, cosine, theta. On our reference table, we are given this, P equals delta energy over time. So that's what you have to work with, but you need to understand these other energy relationships, like I just said. So you need to know that this is work over time. So you can also express power as the amount of work over time that's done. And we know that work is F displacement cosine theta, where the theta is the angle in between the displacement and the force over time. But what we see from way back here in number one, that X over T is really V bar. So that's where this relationship comes. I can say that power is equal to this force, then this X over T is really V bar cosine theta. This often tricks kids because they can't understand how they can relate velocity change and average velocity to power. I highly recommend memorizing this formula when it comes to power. Six is being able to take linear relationships and translate them into rotation. They do not rewrite all the rotation formulas for rotational kinematics because they assume that you can derive them from linear relationships earlier in the year. Here's what I mean. For example, a is equal to delta V over T. This is on your reference table, but what they don't give you is the rotation counterpart. Alpha equals change in omega over T. And this holds true even for the bigger formulas. We know that displacement equals V naught T plus one half AT squared. What they do not write on the reference table is that a change in theta is equal to omega naught T plus one half alpha T squared. They do not give you these rotational relationships. You must be able to derive them or memorize them. Another example would be like V final squared equals V initial squared plus 2AX. You need to be able to say that omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus 2 alpha theta. So you must memorize the fact that you need to be able to go from linear relationships to rotational relationships. These rotation formulas are not on the reference table. And that kind of blends into number seven. You need to be able to identify the linear to rotational relationships when it comes to just a single variable and not a formula. Here's what I mean. We have to say that if I'm giving some sort of tangential velocity and also the distance from the axis of rotation r, I can then find omega of that object. The same holds true. If I know linear acceleration and I know the distance from the axis of rotation, that's going to tell me the alpha of that object. And also, if I know the displacement of that object, the axis of rotation, I can therefore tell you theta. I can guarantee you, you are going to have to use these relationships on the AP exam. And the way that I remembered, because I was never sure what the R went next to, like does the R go next to the linear one or does it go next to the rotational one? Very simple for me to understand. I remember that linear things were a little bit easier, so they're simpler. There's only one thing on the left of the equal sign, where rotation is a little bit more complex. So there's two things on the side. So I make sure that the R is going next to, and you see it's always linear, R, and it's rotational counterpart. Linear, R, rotational counterpart. You need to be able to understand these and be able to use them as well. The eighth one is on your reference table, I will write it in red so we know that it actually is on the reference table, is this relationship of centripetal acceleration that equals V squared over R. What you need to be able to memorize and understand that when we saw F equals MA, this can also be written in terms of circular motion. Centripetal force, which is the net force that acts towards the center of the circle, that equals MAC. So you need to memorize this relationship, but you know that already from Newton's second law. So then we can rewrite this using what's on the reference table and say that centripetal force, the force that acts towards the center of a circle for an object moving in circular motion, is equal to the mass of that object that's circling, its tangential speed squared over r. I would highly recommend re you know remembering this. You can, of course, know this relationship, but look at all this time that we're using. Just know that centripetal force equals m v squared over r. You will be good to go. The ninth thing that I recommend you memorizing is that the moment of inertia for a point particle is m r squared. 
Now, I'm going to give you the eyes for everything else because you need calculus to derive moment of inertia for a lot of things. And this is an algebra-based course. But you need to memorize the point particle one. If you want, I highly recommend as well. They're going to give you this, but just for time purposes, for a solid disk, mr squared for a disk. I would remember this, and this is for a point particle. And also that if you have given an axis of rotation here and there's multiple points acting, the total moment of inertia is going to be equal to mr squared of all of those points. That is not given on your reference table. Sometimes you'll see this in textbooks written as total inertia is equal to I, M, I, R, I squared. Just That's what that means when I say the sum here. But you need to memorize that for a point particle moving around an axis of rotation that's rotating like this, you need to remember that that's M, R squared for the I, and that if I have multiple points in a plane, I have to sum all of them up. And just as like an added bonus, remember a solid disk because that's going to be your pulleys and things like that. So remembering 1 half M R squared will save you a little bit of time in the end. And the last one, I put this last. If you're taking the test in 2020, electricity is not on that exam, but for any other years, guys, we have to remember that they give you P equals VI on the reference table. Okay. But you also need to remember that the relationship of V equals IR, Ohm's law, can be applied. So I can solve for power if I don't know V or if I don't know I. For example, say I don't know V. I can take IR, which is equal to V, and solve for P by saying IR times I, which is really P equals I squared R. This is how you can find power if you do not know potential difference but it's not on the reference table. Also, if I don't know I, I can say that I equals V divided by R. So I can say that P equals V times V over R. So another way that I can express power is just by saying V squared over R. If there is a formula, guys, that you guys use a lot that is not on the reference table that you think you need to memorize, leave them down in the comments below. I'll make sure that I edit in an updated video in the future, but pretty sure off the top of my head, these are 10 that we use throughout the entire year that you need to memorize. Until I catch you guys on the next one, have a great day, happy studying, and I'll catch you on the next one.